Actually, let me start by asking the panelists a question. Um, so uh, Eric, is this working? Yeah. Uh, Eric raised the uh, issue in, in, uh, in their talk um, about whether um, some uh, issues that might come up might be actually underdetermined by the ethical intuitions we have. I mean, our ethical intuitions are based on cases um, involving, you know, relatively familiar considerations, um, but we might be confronted with cases where the, the ethical intuitions that are the basis for ethical theories just run out and they don't have anything to say, but it seems like we've got to make some kind of decision. Anybody want to speak to that? I think that's true, um, and it raises problems about what to do in those cases, but I don't think that's a special problem in ethics. Uh, me and Eric were talking yesterday about the about epistem epistemic normativity um, and our epistemic norms, and they're going to be have similar problems. So I'm not, I, I'd like to hear more about why that raises challenges. It seems the moral status case is actually not that hard. There's problems with determining um, which cap when we're going to detect capacities and, and which capacities. We can fight about which capacities give rise to moral status, but there's actually not that much intuitioning going on, we almost, I think everyone up here would agree that uh, the capacity for suffering is a morally relevant capacity. Either it's um, relevant because we desire not to or just at its base. And so we all agree on that. And so once you, ha once you have that, if everybody agrees to that, that tells you a lot about one thing to protect AI from. So are there other capacities that we haven't imagined that we should be sensitive to? Maybe, but you can get a lot of ground with the agreement we've, I think we all have. Um, I actually have a slightly different view, which is that I think that as technologies get better, we're gonna, these vagueness problems are going to arise, and we're, uh, they're going to be hard. So let me just give a few examples. So now people are putting uh, embryonic stem cells into uh, sort of uh, mice and uh, maybe sometimes chimpanzees, and there are real issues about whether they're acquiring human-like levels um, uh, capacity. So these mice can do way better. They, you can see their uh, dendrites sort of totally growing, uh, you know, like t much denser than compared to normals. And so I think that's going to raise issues. Like um, it's going to raise issues about what's it like to be X, you know, where we just have no idea. So we got these ordinary cases, but then there are these sort of, and then the other thing is sort of with genetic, with CRISPR and genetic engineering, there are issues about um, sort of uh, chimeras human animal chimeras, other animal chimeras, and they're all, I, I think that's a really good question. And I, I, I don't know if I'd be, I, I would, I think they need some sort of, we need to think more carefully about these issues, so. Any of the panelists have any uh, questions for each other? I, uh, I had a question um, on uh, the last talk. So I was wondering why well, I was thinking, I mean, one of the th things about the committee that you were, fo I mean, you, the, the committee as you were talking about it was f entirely focused on risks to the AI participants, right? But you could imagine a similar committee which would also be tasked with looking at risks to humans and society and, you know, those sorts of things, the kinds of things that have been emphasized by uh, uh, Bostrom and uh, Yukovsky and those, you know, that people. And so I was wondering, and it seems like it would draw upon a similar l range of expertise, and also that you might get more buy-in because people might not care much about the status of AIs, but they sure care a lot about the future of humanity. So I was wondering why you weren't thinking about the committee in terms of taking on both of those tasks. Yeah, uh, I think that there's things that are exactly analogous, right? So you you, pr you propose certain design principles that you put into the artificial intelligence to make sure that its moral status is recognized. This is to set off a certain set of you know, head off a certain set of problems. Uh, and this morning we heard a lot about trying to figure out how to build in other kinds of architectures into the AI to build up to to foreclose all kinds of other types of threats to human beings, right? Um, and in both cases you have a, an issue of of how do you ensure that these things are actually done. And so you'd have a, an oversight model. Uh, so, so some kind of oversight model and maybe a committee-based model would be appropriate for that. So this wasn't meant in any way as uh, being exclusionary of that. Uh, we do have to think a little bit about whether the same type of committee model is appropriate. We, had, we talked a little bit actually about this over lunch. Uh, and, and so we weren't, we're not 100% sure about that, uh, but it could probably be extended in that way. Okay, questions? 
said. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Mr. Liao, is it? Mm -hmm. Your theory of the moral worth of a human being by its genetic constitution mm -hmm. would entitle frozen embryos mm -hmm. to be protected until they could be implanted in somebody willing. Mm -hmm. And also that if in the future it becomes possible to transfer a fetus into an artificial womb, mm -hmm. that pregnant women uh, would be obliged if they want to terminate their pregnancy to have the child safely transferred. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually agree with this implication. I would go farther than that, but just based on your principle, this is what it entails. What do you think? Uh, I think it does entail that. So I think that one of the, the one of the things I've actually argued in print is that when we do IVF, uh, right now we're creating too many embry excess embryos, anyways, and so you know it's a reason for just sort of uh, producing enough the embryos that you're actually going to implant. So th it, you know it could be um, sort of as it were a technical problem in the future. So. Nice. Okay. Um, so all of you. Um, in to some degree or another touched on the idea of a human grade artificial intelligence system. And to give some context to this question, I'd like to give two short scenarios. The first being a family decides to have a child, um, resulting in a family, which is obviously fine. But then you imagine a company who decides to produce a bunch of babies for a developmental study. Um, and so my question is, um, a lot of you talked about like doing research to to explore human grade artificial intelligence systems, but what kind of ethical implications surround the creation of these systems? This deals a lot with um, the last talk we had, but I'd like to hear your thoughts from all of you. Uh, you know, well, my inclination would be to think that we want to be very careful about having companies create beings with uh, human grade moral status. Um, you know, there's definitely a risk that that would um, create conditions of slavery uh, for the, uh, the artificial beings uh, if they really do deserve moral status. Uh, it might also create uh, the artificial appearance of non-slavery if they're created with uh, uh, self-destructive desires um, or desires to do the bidding of the company in a way that uh, violates the self-respect design principle. So, um, yeah, so I think Mara and I would, would suggest that we should be very cautious about, about allowing that. So um, an issue that's been kind of in the background for a lot of the discussion during this session is that of consciousness. But it's been something that's been kind of blocked because it's tricky. It's really tricky to say what consciousness is or how to detect it. But I, I guess I want to ask um, a background question to that is, do you, do you for any of you, do you think that the capacity for consciousness is a necessary condition for moral status. And to make that more concrete, suppose we have a very, very sophisticated AI, very behaviorally complex, can do lots of apparently goal-directed things, but we're convinced on independent grounds it does not have phenomenal consciousness. There's nothing it's like to be this AI. Does that mean that this thing is disqualified from having moral status? And if so, what is it about consciousness that is that gives moral status? Okay. Well, I mean, it might be valuable as a very sophisticated artifact without consciousness, but presumably you're caring about that thing in particular. And when you're giving something moral consideration, you're giving it like consideration from its point of view or like you're considering its ends. And it doesn't make sense to do that if it doesn't have a point of view. So I guess that's kind of where I see consciousness being important, although like difficult to pin down or being its own issue. So I don't think you need to have consciousness in order to have moral status. So if you look at the slide that I have, look at plants. Plants, let's unless you're panpsychist, you think they don't have consciousness, and but they have moral standing. So we shouldn't just go around chopping off plants. So you might think there there, there already are entities that have moral uh, moral status without consciousness. Um, so you know, the rationality might give you something else. So if you're zombies, they, it might give you a different kind of moral status, but I, I don't see why in principle you couldn't have moral status just because you don't have consciousness. Uh, oh. Paul disagrees. <laughs> um, yeah. 
I want to say something real quick. So sort of uh, also deeper in the background in these, all of us, when we talk about moral status, I think really mean a specific kind of moral status, not just something that means you're an object of concern, but your welfare is subject to our concern. Um, and so the disagreement you're getting here is a disagreement over the nature of welfare. So if you're any kind of mentalist or subjectivist about welfare, you're going to think it's a necessary condition for moral status under this framework. And if you're not, like it sounds like Matt is not, if you're an objective lister that has natural functioning or teleological components, then it's, it's not going to be necessary. That's right. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to sort of visualize how this institutional review board model would work. And I have some difficulty just thinking about the way that AI research is structured and the tempo of research. So with invertebrate research, typically you would plan your experiment m many months in advance, and you do a few experiments per year, perhaps. But uh, with an AI lab, maybe you run 10,000 experiments in an afternoon with slight permutations, and then midway through you see it doesn't work, so you think what would happen if we fiddled with this thing. Um, it's just harder to see how that in a practical way could work if you had to apply for pre-approval by some committee. Um, also, most medical research is sort of done in an institutional setting uh, in academia by industry, whereas a lot of AI research still today, you, you, you can do it as an individual, and you're, you're like, you, you really um, don't need this, it doesn't have the same resource requirements. Uh, so would this only apply to the research done by institutions, or would it apply to anybody who just wants to play around with TensorFlow and implement some new idea they have? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Can I answer the second one first? Say something like, um, maybe the industries have to get they have to get approval, but then you could sign an agreement to do um, experiments using their code or their implementations or something, and they're approved via approval of the institution. So maybe you could work around it that way. I hadn't thought much about that challenge, but it is a serious problem that you can do these things sort of in your um, backyard, so to speak. That's true of human subjects research. I guess, um, <laughs> but also this thing about uh, the like numbers of experiments. I think if you before IRBs, if you had told researchers that um, that you were going to do this, they would say, "Well, that's not how research works. We start a thing, and then we, you know, we might start another s experiment in parallel once we see some results and things like that." And we just don't allow that anymore, right? You have to get protocols. So you could imagine protocols that give them a lot of flexibility with what they're allowed to do and how many things they're allowed to run in a given protocol. Um, but they don't get total flexibility. So you might not limit the total number of experiments. They can tell you in advance, these are the different number of ways we want to try to instantiate learning. Um, and we don't see a problem on any of them. Can we get approval for this wide range? And then you let them run within that range. First get, first pass. Uh, uh, two, two important precursors to the no difference argument. Um, the first is uh, Andy Clark and Dave Chalmers' uh, parity principle for extended mind. When an object counts as part of my extended mind, it has to meet parity, which means there has to be no difference between its processing and mine. Uh, the more important precursor is Turing's test, uh, which hasn't come up in this conference yet, which is kind of interesting. Uh, uh, so Turing's test is, is over 60 years old, um, and it hasn't been convincing. So I wonder why the no difference argument is going to be more convincing than the Turing test, which is basically a no difference argument. Right, yes, yeah, so the Turing test is a no difference argument, but it's one that, um, relies on a limited range of types of evidence, right? So there's no di observable difference in verbal exchange um, as judged by a human judge of a certain sort, right? So, um, so that's a, a very limited range of ev evidence, and I would hope that um, you know, a, a fuller examination would in, uh, draw on a diversity of evidence and not just that. Um, so I do think that's an important precursor uh, that's similar in spirit um, but I guess I just wouldn't limit it in quite that way. I'd like to um, ask a question that perhaps extends the idea of uh, moral standing to moral importance. Uh, in us humans, when we suffer the loss of someone with whom we have a, an important relationship, we suffer. So let's say somebody kills our spouse or kills, somebody, uh, kills the leader of an important movement. Uh, there may be one or many people who suffer greatly uh, psychic pain and emotional suffering from that loss. My question is, if we have a, a virtual or artificial intelligence entity, say without consciousness, uh, without any physicality, without sentience, desire, without any capability of moral agency, might the elimination of that entity uh, be of such moral importance that it might be equivalent 
uh, to the loss of someone who has moral standing or even of greater moral importance. I, I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, you know, once you don't have sentience and all the things, you kind of ruled out everything. It looks like it's my phone. I mean, I feel bad when my phone, dro you know, drop it in the water, and <laughs> I, I'm sort of mourning for a couple of days because I lost all the photos. But, you know, but, I mean, that would be that level, right? Um, so it's when the interesting issue is when you add in all those different things, then whether we should be mourning an artificial moral intelligence the way we would mourn a person. And that, uh, what you're raising is something, so one of the things I mentioned is intrinsic properties. That gives us, that gives something the moral standing. But then in addition, you might have extrinsic properties. You might have certain relations. So once you have a companion AI, you come to develop certain relationship with the AI, then you might feel attached, and in which case you would have these additional considerations towards this entity. Mara, you want to? Oh. I was just gonna say, yeah, like, I mean, when you design an artifact, you could have ethics around its design because maybe it's a weapon and it's gonna harm people and it shouldn't be built or something like that. But the point with AI um, would be that you're also taking into consideration in the ethics of the design, consideration for the thing itself, not for what impact it'll have. So something like that, I don't think would have that kind of consideration. I'm thinking about these, uh the AI subject committees. I was thinking about what kind of treatment of the AIs is the relevant kind here. I mean, you talked at one point as if it was mostly pain and suffering, but there's all kinds of things we might do to systems beyond pain and suffering that seem very morally relevant. And, you know, thinking about, for example, what goes on in a uh, machine learning system, you know, with big data and, you know, long-term supervised learning over time, trial after trial for after you know, millions of trials. That's the kind of thing we might call cruel and unusual punishment if, uh, <laughs> if it was, if say, a human child was, uh, was subjected to this. So is there going to be a moral issue uh, there? Not to mention the possibilities for like brainwashing as you take an AI system and retrain it on a whole bunch of new data into different directions. <laughs> At what point do these issues arise? Uh, good question. Um, so <laughs> I, I didn't mean to, when I say suffering, I want to understand that broadly, including things like frustration and feelings of stress and other things like that. So I have this little paper where I just argue that at least it seems like a capacity for uh, enjoyment and suffering might be necessary, even though it's it's not uh, uh, maybe not sufficient for moral status, but it's necessary. There's nothing wrong with a, there's, let's say there's a, a computer that can have experiences of color and that's the only phenomenal states it can have. It seems to me morally unproblematic to make it see green forever rather than red forever or alternate the colors. Um, maybe that's not true. I try to argue for that. Um, so it's gotta, uh, there's gotta be certain, um, sort of attitudinal responses or it's got to have desires or something like that in order for it to be problematic. Um, so the machine learning case, it's only going to be bad for it to be subject to these infinite tests if it cares about being subject to infinite tests. The last question. Thank you. I, I just want to... <laughs> Thank you, Ned. <laughs> Let me take this opportunity now. Um, <laughs> I do want to comment on the disagreement that was implicit between what Mara was saying, what Matthew was saying. Look, it se does seem to me that the, the distinction, which I think Peter Railton alluded to a few questions back, between having value and having moral status is mm. very, very important in this connection. So there are many things that have value and which it would therefore be wrong to destroy without those being things that you are actually wronging. So uh, plants, I think, are probably... A painting is like... A beautiful right. painting by Titian is like that. It would be wrong to destroy it, but not because it would suffer, mm -hmm. uh, but just because it's a valuable thing that it would be wrong to destroy. And I think for these purposes, uh, nothing could be more important than that distinction. Now, whether uh, being the kind of thing that can be wronged it requires consciousness or how that's exactly to be understood, whether that's suffering, I'm inclined to think that it is really a phenomenal notion, and not just that of having a point of view. You could think of that a machine as having a point of view in the sense of a representation of its place in space and time and so forth, without undergoing the kinds of states that arouse moral concern, namely pain and suffering. Yeah, great. So, um, so thanks. So, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I agree with that. I think that there's a distinction between being interested in something 
and having an interest in, you know, just having an interest in something. So being interested in something requires that you desire, you know, you have consciousness, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's the other thing, which is just having an interest. And some people, I mean, this is up for debate. Some people think that plants can have the later, uh, latter kinds of interests, and that is sufficient for it to have moral status. Uh, whereas you might think, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's an open question whether you know, artworks can have that, you know, uh, I'm inclined to think artworks is more like have in extrinsic properties rather than intrinsic properties. But, you know, certainly plants, you might think in virtue of their complexity, they have some sort of intrinsic property and it's in their interest, uh, it's in their interest to be water, to get sunlight, et cetera, et cetera, whether they can desire or not. Um, so, but, but I understand the problem, so. Looks like our panel.